if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. It's because the book's contents were written generations hence by hairy desert dwelling gents squatting in their dusty tents. Just because what heaven said was said before that leavened bread, just because Jesus couldn't read, doesn't mean that we should need when manipulating human genes to alleviate pain or fight disease. When deciding whether it's wrong or right to help the die and let go of life. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Because certain men were lying with other men as with women, and the Lord taught of Israel certainly did not recognize same-sex marriages. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years, which goes to show that the Bible, which does not condone slavery like William Lane Craig had said, doth in fact condone slavery. You know, like Dan Savage said. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because Todd allowed that to happen in the previous verse, because the children of Israel did evil inside the Lord. So Todd had to allow this, but at the same time, none of this was Todd's fault. We really need to stop blaming her for getting ourselves into these types of situations. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains, caves, strongholds, even though none of these things have any bearing at all whatsoever on the rest of the chapter. And so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, who were fairly put out from the events of the previous few chapters, and the children of East, who were bugger all worth identifying conclusively, even they came up against them, which is even more vague than the phrase, children of the East. And they encamped against them, all the while doing things, and building stuff, and going to places, and talking to people, and causing certain events to come to pass, all in an effort to keep this narrative as vague as possible. And they destroyed the increase of the earth, again doing certain things as shady as possible, and leaving no solid evidence that they ever did those things in that location until I come into Gaza. And considering that my viewers, whoever they may happen to be, in whatever location, probably have never been to this place in Gaza, that means they are probably still there, in that spot, doing these things to those people. And they left no sustenance for Israel, except of course the substance that will appear later in this very chapter. Neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass, nor in the other stuff, who shall go unmentioned for the time being. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and some other tools to do the activity, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, so thou knowest it is a rather large mob of indeterminate size, for both they and their camels were without number, and we can also assume that their cattle, besides the camels, were also without number. And they entered into the land, wherever it was, to destroy it. And now that you've read these verses, thou hast every bit of information thou needest to perform a thorough archaeological investigation to find out that these people did those things a long, long time ago in a land far away. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, for they were the 1%. And the children of the 99% held a rally and protests against them and occupied the Holy Land. And they cried unto the Lord, because they did not like the fact that all these dastard ethnic minorities were allowed to live in the same area that they did. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel continued to cry unto the Lord from the verse immediately preceding this one, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which, and again, bears repeating that the Bible means, who, said unto them, Thou oughtest to listen to a crazy desert-dwelling, scientifically literate, and possibly also literacy illiterate, better one goat herder who happens to hear voices in his head and call himself a prophet. Anyway, listen good, you unwashed ignorant masses, for I am only going to say this once. Thus saith the Lord taught of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, which is the exact same credentials Todd has been using ever since the book of Exodus. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave, uh, drave, what, drave? I drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your Todd. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, and never mind this verse, hearken back into the time when Judaism was in fact a polytheistic religion, and the cult of Yahweh happened to win the culture war. But ye have not obeyed my voice. And several of the Israelites then complained that they only disobeyed Todd's voice after she failed to live up to her end of the bargain, and did not actually drave out the rightful inhabitants of the land they now occupied, like she said she was going to. 
and Todd was mad because the Israelites pointed out the bloody obvious, and she gave them all hemorrhoids, which, believe it or not, is actually mentioned in the Bible, because she wanted the Israelites to know how much of a pain in the ass they were being. And there came an angel of the Lord, and his identity as the angel of the Lord, and not the Lord herself, becomes of vital importance to verses from now. And the angel sat under a tree which sent Oprah, because she gained so much weight that she was now even bigger than she was in the movie The Color Purple. And Oprah, or perhaps the oak tree, pertaineth unto Joash the Abizarite, or however thou sayest that. And his son Gideon thrust wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites, just in case wheat was one of those things that those people confiscated when they took certain stuff earlier in the chapter. And the angel of the Lord, the same angel of the Lord apparently, and not some other angel of some other Lord, appeared to him, him being Gideon, as he was hiding copies of the Bible in hotel bedside end tables. And the angel of the Lord said to him, the Lord, who is definitely some other entity other than myself, is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And at this point, Gideon was thoroughly confused, as he had never been to war, and thus had never done anything all that valorous. But in this day and age, whenever it was that this story took place, abject insanity was highly re respected, and speaking to an apparition and calling it the angel of the Lord would have been considered an act of bravery, worthy of a shiny medal, or even a bronze statue commemorating the event. And Gideon said unto him, O my lord, even though thou art but an angel of the Lord, and not the Lord herself, if the Lord be with this, then why is all this befallen us? Not only that, but those other things as well, that those people over yonder did to us whenever that other thing happened. And where be all her miracles, which shall go unspecified, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? And we answered unto our fathers, saying, There is absolutely no historical or archaeological evidence that such an event ever happened. The Israelites were never enslaved en masse in Egypt. There were never ten plagues. There was never an exodus. The Israelites never crossed the Red Sea. Two million people never wandered around the Sinai Desert in a sunk stroke stupor. For forty years, there was never a supernatural migration of quails, and manna only exists in video games. Further, the Israelites never crossed the Jordan River, the walls of Jericho did not fall down flat because they yelled at it, as the city of Jericho did not actually exist in the time frame described in the scriptures. In fact, it's a safe bet that most of the places the Bible states Israel conquered in the book of Joshua also did not exist as it's described. Given that, it's fair to say that our fathers never described any miracles performed by Todd when she brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, as not only did those events never occur, but Todd does not actually exist. Having said all that, who in the bloody hell am I talking to? And the Lord, apparently taken over for the angel of the Lord, answered Gideon and said, I am the Lord Todd of Israel, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, and I most certainly exist because the Bible says that I do. And Gideon said, Then you are the one who has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. What do you have to say about that? Huh? Huh? And the Lord, apparently not the angel, Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And do be careful, for one does not simply walk into the land of the Midianites. And he said unto her, O my lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house, and we are all but hobbits of the shire. Besides, art not thou the one that sold us into the hand of the Midianites in the first place? So should it not be thou who rescues us? Why do I have to do all the dirty work? And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And Gideon answered, Now this story did take the same format as the previous chapters in this book of stupid. And the Lord said, No, no, I will be with thee this time, I promise. Peaky swear? And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And Gideon said, With what? My gardening hoe? And the Lord reached behind her and handed Gideon a brand new sword. And she said unto him, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Now, the following few verses tend to get rather confusing, what with the nonspecific personal pronouns habit that the Bible tends to have. Luckily for the viewer, I have my own particular habit, in that I tend to refer to Todd as a woman. Oh, and I tend to use the name Todd. I am not quite certain that the viewer has caught on to that yet. Of course, I use the name Todd in place of God as more of a paradigm shift to get the viewer to think more critically about the deity that he or she chooses to worship. I use the female-specific third-person pronoun to reflect the fact that, in our studies of anthropology, we know that the earliest religions worshipped a goddess as their primary deity, usually in a polytheistic belief system. It was the 
ancient Israelites that gave Yahweh the ultimate sex change as they did not wish to worship a female, as we all know that women are worth less than men, besides being the weaker sex. Anyway, my doctored version of the narrative says this, And he said to her, If I have found grace in thy sight, then shew me a sign that thou talkest with me, for certainly other people shall think that I am completely nuts, and I will have to have solid proof that I am talking to the Almighty Creator of the universe, and not listening to voices inside of my head. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And she said, I will tell thee until thou come again. And Todd began to sing a song, and she sang, <laughs> I will wait for you. Well, anyway, Gideon went in and made ready a kid and told the kid to help him cook a baby goat. And he made unleavened cakes of an e pot of flour. The flesh he put into a basket, hoping all the time that it was the flesh of the goat and not the flesh of the boy. And he put broth in a pot and brought it out unto her under the oak, which is in Oprah, and presented it. And the viewer is to ignore the fact that even though the Midianites had starved the Israelites to the point that they think the children in the Hunger Games were fairly well fed and with a balanced diet, Gideon was able to find a veritable bounty of an entire epaw of flour, a baby goat, and enough left over for a bowl full of broth. Or perhaps Gideon did in fact cook a kid, which would not be unheard of in this particular book. And the angel of Todd, and not Todd herself, apparently said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth, for I don't want to eat any of that disgusting crap. And Gideon was about to protest that the bowl full of broth was enough to feed an entire family for a week, and it would be an indescribable waste, and quite immoral at that, to simply pour it all out on the ground. But with a tear in his eye and a hunger pain in his little tummy, he did what Todd commanded him, and he poured out the broth out on the ground, and resisted the temptation to collapse down on the ground and lick it back up. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in her hand, which was bugger all worth mentioning up to the point when it was most convenient for the plot, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and the rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And once again Gideon complained about the wasted food that would have been better served feeding the starving people around him than being charred beyond all use on a makeshift altar. So for her own safety, the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight, because surely she was about to be set upon by a band of starving Israelites, who at this point said that food was food, and angels of the Lord tended to make for some fairly good eating. And when Gideon perceived that she was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord Todd, for I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Of course, this verse makes absolutely no sense. If Gideon just now realized that the entity was the angel of the Lord, why was he referring to her as the Lord in the previous verses? There certainly cannot be a reasonable distinction between the Lord and the angel of the Lord, as these verses have been using the two phrases interchangeably. And if there was some meaningful distinction between the two, then apparently Gideon was more afraid of the angel of the Lord than of the Lord herself. Apparently, Gideon can converse with the almighty creator of the universe as if she was a living, breathing, sentient being, and not just a voice in his head, but seeing the apparition of the angel of the Lord was far too much for him to bear. And the Lord poked a hair out from under the table next to Gideon and said, Peace be unto you, fear not, for thou shalt not die. However, I am afraid that I might. And the mob of starving Israelites suddenly appeared. There she is, she's hiding underneath the table! And Todd started running as fast as a little lace carrier and barely escaped being eaten alive. And Gideon, for want of anything better to do at that particular point in time, built an altar there unto the Lord for no apparent reason. And he called it Jehovah Shalom, which in Hebrew means Todd of Peace. For at this location, a band of starving crazy Israelites nearly got themselves a piece of Todd. And to this day it is yet an Oprah of the Abyssalites, and thou shalt find it if thou travelest unto Oprah of the Abyssalites, assuming that thou canst even find it on a map. And it came to pass the same night, whichever night that happened to be, that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullet, even the second bullet of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove beside it. Never ye mind that ye shall commit theft of thy father's property direct discrimination of another man's privately held religious beliefs, and destruction of private property. Some people just like to watch the world burn, and build an altar unto the Lord thy Todd upon this rock. Again, just like the last two times thou buildest altars unto the Lord thy Todd, presumably in the very same place, thou wilt destroy the altar of Baal, which 
would not be a more clear act of persecution even if thou wert to wear a sheet upon thine head and light a cross on fire in thy neighbor's front yard. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. And Gideon thought about this for a moment and said, So let me get this straight. I am to cut down the groves because they are used for pagan worship, correct? And Todd said, Correct. So the groves are evil. And she answered, Thoroughly evil. Destroy it completely. And Gideon said, So to use the groves for any religious purposes to be considered perverted and corrupt, and all protectors of it are to be condemned. And Todd said, That's right, you're starting to get the idea. And Gideon answered, So you want to use evil trees with pagan significant for an act of animal sacrifice, which is also pagan in origin, to kill a bullock that I stole from my father, violating thine own commandments in the process, which at the very least ought to be used to feed starving children instead of satiating your own lust for burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the Lord answered and said, Um, well, yeah, uh, yes, that about sums it up. And Gideon shrugged and said, Seems legit. Let's get this party started. Then Gideon took ten men and his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household, which makes sense because he had just sold in his father's bullock and vandalized his property, and the men of the city, because they were starving, and Gideon quite literally poured the food down the drain. That he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. For although this was done by the direct commandment of the Almighty Creator of the universe, who has been known to burn her enemies to a crisp and open up the earth to swallow them whole, Gideon did not stand a chance against a village of weak and starving goat herders. And when the men of the city rose early in the morning, for this time was growling, and the scent of barbecued bullock was a wafting from the general direction of Joash's altar of Baal, they went over to the neighbor's place to see if perhaps there would be enough food to feed their families. But behold, the altar of Baal was cut down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built, all using a series of passive statements as they were not altogether certain who it was that did all these things. And they said to one another, Who hath done this thing? Bring that unknown person hither, so we may do certain unspecified things to him, which may or may not fit the legal definition of torture. Also, do you have anything to eat? For we are starving! And when they inquired in Ness, they evidently answered themselves in the most vague and not specific terms possible. Gideon, the son of Joash, had done this thing. They were also certain that Gideon did that other thing a few days ago with that stuff belonging to those people, but alas, they had no evidence that that other stuff even happened. Then the men of the city, whoever they were, said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, because he hath cut down the grove that was by it, and we take such overt acts of religious persecution very seriously in this particular time frame. And Joash said unto all that stood against them, Listen up, you mob of unidentified Semitic individuals standing in my general vicinity. Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, whoever it may be, let him be put to death while he is yet mourning, for such religiously motivated terroristic threats are most certainly reciprocal in nature. If he be a god, and not some non-existent entity like Yahweh, Allah, or Arjibas, let him plead for himself because one has cast down his altar. And Baal answered and said, Come on, guys, it really isn't that big of a deal. I'm a god of peace, after all. And Jebus said unto Baal, Shut your festering pie hole, you filthy, peace-loving hippie. If you're not going to call down wrath upon these people who destroyed your altar, how are they supposed to believe you exist? No wonder they think you're a false god. And Bell said, Aw, oh, man. Therefore, on that day, he, whoever he was, called him Drew Bell, saying, Let Bell plead against them, because he has thrown down his altar. And Bell said quietly, I didn't even want an altar built. But the people paid no attention to him. So, all the Indianites, Amalekites, children of the East, and all those other people over there were still hanging around, doing the same things they were doing in verse 3. And they went over to the place and pitched their tents and other camping gear in the valley of Jezreel, although they will not tell us exactly where. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he now suddenly knew how to play the trumpet better than Louis Armstrong. And Abiezer was gathered after him, and a certain number of people, who shall remain undisclosed for security reasons, and they listened to Gideon's jazz concert. And he sent messengers all throughout Manasseh, who advertised a U.S. Osro for the troops, but failed to mention the fact that said troops were about to go to war against the Midianites, Amalekites, and children of the East, whoever they were. But Asher liked the idea of fighting children because he thought it would be easy. 
Zebulon hadn't been in a decent scrap since the previous chapter, and once again Naphtali came along for the ride. And they came up to meet them, once again fulfilling the requirements in this chapter that an unidentified group of indeterminate size was about to meet some other unspecified people in an undisclosed location for some unknown purpose. We'll just have to flesh out the details later. And Gideon, who at this point was not entirely 100% certain what this mob of indeterminate size was supposed to do in the immediately following chapter, decided to produce a double-blind scientific experiment to assess the validity of Todd's existence and the claim she was making, which would most certainly pass the rigorous tests of replication and peer review and would be accepted for publication in every scientific journal. And Gideon said unto Todd, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, and thou hast said that by means of the voices I am hearing in my head, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. Though exactly where I put the fleece is unspecified, and I have no more clue what the definition of a scientific control is. The dependent variable is the fleece, and the independent variable is the dew upon the fleece. My hypothesis shall be that there will be dew upon the fleece and not on the ground, which shall provide absolute scientific evidence that Todd actually exists, that she is the almighty creator of the universe, and that she will save Israel by my hand. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and put on a long white lab coat, grabbed his clipboard, and rushed over to record the results of the experiment. He thrust the fleece together and rained out the dew of the fleece into a clear glass container. However, the container was not clearly marked as to ascertain the exact volume, so the results were not only as accurate as a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto Todd, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Allow me to repeat the experiment, changing the hypothesis only slightly, that it will be dry only upon the fleece, and upon the ground there will be dew. I still have no idea what the word control means in science. Late that night, Gideon's wife walked out of the kitchen and went outside to smoke a cigarette. She saw the fleece on the ground and remembered that earlier in the day her husband accidentally discovered a brilliant method of water conservation in a hot, desert environment. She picked up the fleece and wrung out the water into a bowl and set it back down on the ground. The next morning, Gideon walked out to inspect the fleece and surmised that Todd performed a miracle, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew all on the ground. And Gideon said that his hypothesis was confirmed, and it was published in all the scientific journals as the Gideon Theory of Dew-Covered Fleeces. Of course, his wife did not have the heart to tell him that she was the one responsible for the dry fleece, and not the disembodied voice inside Gideon's head. Besides, she was a woman, and as a woman she knew her proper place, barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen making sandwiches. For thus is what women were expected to do, and this and that and those other things, with them over there and their cattle and other stuff. And all these things happened a long, long time ago, in a land far away. Gonna stop a pregnancy when it's just a tiny blastocyst. There's no reason why we should take a look at any other book but the good book. Cause it's good and it's a book and it's a book.